Bianca and Michael Alexander, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hi, thank you for having us. It's uh, always a pleasure. It's good to be back, Howard. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted to have a conversation with you that I think is, it's going to be challenging for me. And let me just share where, where I'm coming from and why I thought of you guys. So as you probably know, um, there's sort of a social and political um, maelstrom happening, right? Like in the country, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of uh, factionalism. And I see myself as a very sort of, you know, moral, righteous, progressive person. And I want to be on the right side and I want to do the right thing. And I found myself more so than any other time in my life with the protests for racial justice, becoming incredibly angry, incredibly opinionated, judgmental, divisive and feeling really good about it. Like I was like <laughs> just just on a tear, just like, you know, F you all this <laughs> like normally when I get mad, I feel bad afterwards, like, oh, yeah. I, I overreacted. But there was something about participating in these marches in saying, you know what, like I want to fight against systemic racism. I want to be a part of the solution that kind of gave me sort of internal permission to really to not to put put too fine a point on it, turn into an aggressive, outrageous asshole <laughs> who was helping nobody or nothing. And, part, you know, like partly it's my fight and partly it's not. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And so I and then I saw you guys who sent out an email, the subject line of which I'm not even qualified to speak. <laughs> and I thought like the last time we talked you uh, on the podcast, you guys were really talking about sort of consciousness and spirituality and love. And I'm like, how the hell do they do it? And are they doing it now? And can we can we solve social political problems in this climate while still being uh, paying allegiance to consciousness, to love, to universality, to you and me being the same when in so many ways on this plane we are we are different. So that was a that's probably the longest introduction I've ever given. <laughs> <laughs> so I want I want to shut up and just let you guys <laughs> set, you know, help me. Well, do you want to take you want to no, kick it up? You kick well, it let me just say, first of all, like, thank you so much just for your transparency and your honesty and your willingness to be vulnerable and like being honest about what your journey and your experience has been. Do you understand how hard that is and how much courage that takes to show up in the world as a white, you know, as if any of us is white, you're not white, you're more peachy pink. That's what I told Michael, but as a white man at this time to, sh to show up and just be honest about where you are and where you aren't like, hello, that is the beginning of the conversation that I feel we've all been missing. It's just the honesty and the humility and the, and the willingness to share where you are, I think is just so powerful and so beautiful. So thank you for kicking it off with that. You know, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, my first reaction is like, it doesn't feel, I mean, it doesn't feel brave necessarily. And the only, and I know the only reason I can do it is because of a lot of spiritual work that I've done in the past that had nothing to do with this necessarily. Right. Right. So yeah. so that's one answer you've just you've just reflected back to me that like how spirituality has a place in this. So yes. thank yeah. you. there's and your think, answer. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I'll just say this, Howard, is I think, you know, it, I think I'm glad to hear that you were participating in the marches. And, and you know, I, I, too, felt very uh, I'll call righteous indignation. Um, and there was a there was a, a sense of um, I remember there was days on end as the marches were happening that I would just go out in my backyard and I would play um, uh, my favorite band, uh, Beautiful Chorus, and, and I would just sob for, uh, you know, lap after lap after lap after lap because of you know, just because of the pain body. And this is really what you know, what has been a conversation that we've been having since we've been together is that I, you know, I grew up in San Francisco and I, you know, I had my roommate in college for three years was, and my best friend was black. I 
when a first generation hip hop head and said the N word thousands, if not millions of times, every time I sang my favorite songs and rap my favorite songs. And, and yet when we got together, I really had to, um, you know, I was resistant to the idea that I was racist mm -hmm. and I was resistant to the idea that I even saw color. Uh huh. I was like, no, I don't, I don't see color. I'm, I'm, I'm not racist. And, and what are you guys, what are you black people so mad about? Like, you're like, why? I just don't get why you're like so angry. He literally mm -hmm. did. He, he was clueless. Uh -huh. It's like you listen to hip hop and you say the N word and you, you know, all the words to the best R and B songs and, you know. Yeah, here's you, my, here's my resume, album. right? Yeah, like, right? You're like your black card or my best friend in college. My best friends are black. Some of my best friends are black. My roommate was black. Okay, you got your black card, bam. And yet you have no real connection or understanding of where the fact that there is a pain body and why there is a pain body. So and could you define that? Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I, I think a pain body is like trauma, right? And, you know, we connect to and accept and sort of validate that trauma can happen to people who've, you know, been to war or people that have been, you know, abused or people that have suffered, you know, like a severe physical trauma and accident. But the emotional trauma, the emotional pain body, I call, is not just, um, you know, from systemic institutional racism for 400 plus years, for colonialism, for, you know, eternity, imperialism. There's so many um, sort of isms driven by money and capitalism and patriarchy and white privilege and what Michael has now termed senseless white pride. That's like our little <laughs> meme of the, the senseless white pride um, meme of the week. <laughs> Mostly saying it to him, yes. and referring to himself in, in that in that way, um, but as not as an excuse, but hopefully as a way to kind of identify oneself on the trajectory of where we are in the inside of the pain body. And it's not just black people and and you know descendants of slaves who've suffered the pain body that you know I experience when I think of you know my my parents and like the silent generation and the fact that my my parents drank out of you know black water fountains and had to sit in the nosebleed sections of every theater and when they drove from you know the north to the south you know they couldn't stop on the side of the road like we're going to do you know in our tesla making plug in stops mm, uh, and yes. having, so, you know sit right. in no, the, no no green book there's no yeah there was yes. no green book and so for them it was like you basically pee on the excuse me pee on the side of the road and you better bring your fried chicken basket with you and eat out of it because there ain't no way you're sitting at anybody's counter you know mm -hmm. and that's going to be 12 hours and you know you may want to you may think you have a right to but you could get hung for doing that in certain parts you know of the south so that reality is something i never experienced and that pain body the, the, the traumatic emotional sort of response suppressed often because who are you going to tell who are you going to complain about it a society that doesn't care, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like that's held in your psyche, in your subconscious, in your, your, your posture, you know, in your way of being in the world. You know, I think about my parents and anytime that we, you know, I, I was all, I had a Leo rising. So anytime I was going anywhere, I was always like, okay, front row room service, like, you know, I'm here, you know, I never thought about it. And my parents were always like, well, let's always put, you know, in the back and just sort of, you know, kind of like the church mice. And I always just couldn't understand that. And I thought, well, what must it have been like to walk down the street and feel like, you know, you better bow your head, boy, or don't look me in the eye. You know, so that's the pain body with respect to black people. White people, too, have a pain body because, you know, I always say, you know, like many philosophers, those on opposite sides of the gun share the same fate. Right. Mm. So it's we're all in that dynamic. We're all in that consciousness. We're all in that vibration of oppression and, and inequality and injustice. And that is the pain body that we as Americans share, that white people, that black people, that Native Americans, that anybody that has set foot on American soil and um, you know, sort of participated in the economic, social, cultural sort of exchange um, is affected by what I call the racial pain body. And that is something that must be addressed and healed. And I feel like for the first time in my lifetime, even you know after Barack Obama was elected president, we are beginning to actually open up and talk about things that have never been talked about. That story I shared about being called a nigger at the age of three, when I first learned the word, had no idea what it was, you know, that's a story that I kept inside mm -hmm. for decades. 
And there was something about this culture, this moment where we can open up and talk about it and know that there's people that are actually interested in hearing it and aren't gonna suppress it and say, oh, well, you're being sensitive. Oh, don't be funny, I'm not, I don't see your color. You know, it doesn't matter. We're all in different place. We're post-racial, you know, that was the whole Obama talk. You know, now we're in a place where people are like, well, I'm really interested in black lives do matter and black experiences matter and black, you know, gay, lesbian, trans lives matter. And all these things that we thought, I thought, we didn't have permission to sort of um, to talk about are now coming to the surface. And I feel like, like you said, there's so much opportunity for healing this pain body and there's a lot of trauma. And I just think it's a really good sign that we're opening up and, and allowing ourselves to be seen for who we are and how the feelings that we've kept inside. And, you know, as opposed to my parents generation, you just don't talk about anything ever. You just ball it up, you know, you, you drink, you grow a tur tumor, you have a stroke, you, you know, you silence yourself, mm -hmm. but it's still in there and it's, it's a very unhealthy way to live. So I think we're, we're evolving. That was a very long answer to, I don't even know what your question was, but <laughs> obviously they have a lot of feelings. He said that, he said, what's the racial pain body? Well, there Basically. it is. It's, yes. it's, it's yeah. multi-layer. Yes. Yeah. And I think, and, and let me just say, Howard, I, you know, this is a six, at least a 600 year old conversation because this, when the slave trade began, it basically began this idea that that uh, that what's more important than black and brown lives, freedoms, uh, property is white is white people is white money is white property, and basically what what began was this great um, sort of experiment called colonialism, where the entire uh, you know European um, people basically said, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to impose our under, basically it was just under the auspices of, um, you know, of, we need to tame the savages. We're going to go out and we're going to basically take as much money and land and, uh, and, and make it ours. And we're going to condone everything from rape to murder to death, all under the auspices of, uh, of white privilege, frankly, it's our and right. of colonialism. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, America in its in its essence is the grand experiment, the grand colonial experiment, you know, and, and so what we're talking about is a 600 year old pain body for uh, for a group of people that have been suppressed systemically for hundreds of years, generation upon generation upon generation upon generation upon generation simply because of the, the amount of mel uh, melanin that they have in their skin. Mm -hmm. And so finally, I think after 600 years, we're coming to this awareness that, hey, it's been 600 years and, mm -hmm. and we need to deal with this. Can and we, we actually need to have a conversation about this. Can we just talk about you know, I mean, like, uh -huh. praised, God bless North Carolina, your home state, Asheville, the very first state to approve reparations. Like, wow, that's a huge step forward. But, you know, from our perspective, just having a conversation, like, mm -hmm. can we just talk about it? And I feel like these are things that for so long we couldn't even talk about without people feeling judged and the shame and sort of the whole, like, need to sort of suppress our own humanity. You know, I mean, you know, I was watching this series on Netflix. I don't know why I've been obsessed with it. Maybe it's the scientist in my mind, Babies on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen oh, it, but yeah. One of, yeah, it's just it's just fascinating about like the biology of humanity and you know how we become human beings um, studied through the lens of babies from birth you know, up to, I don't know, toddler talking, all the different phases of attachment. Anyway, one of the things that was interesting that I personally have experienced and share with some of my friends who aren't white is that, you know, we babies learn to be racist at six months, you know, and it's because they can see when it's someone that looks like their group, right? There's that moment at six months where their brain can, you know, associate um, and those that are not. And I've experienced that from little toddlers, you know, particularly in places where there weren't a lot of black people like in Asia, um, where, you know, it, it was just, they, they would just see me, they see Michael ah, and they see me and it's like, ah! Oh my gosh. <laughs> Babies like reach out to me like normally it's like babe you know we like I get on their level we have this conversation so because they weren't exposed you know here American babies it's less of that but like because they were never exposed to you know people that look like me in Asia and let me tell you some of the worst racism I've ever personally experienced was while living in Asia um, in Bali in Indonesia unbelievable 
partly because of the lack of education, partly because there's not a lot of African Americans that go there. It's a very patriarchal society and a society that's the result of very deep and very long recent colonialism by the Dutch. Um, and so inside of that, there's a lot of uh, just pain body, I'll just say. And so seeing Michael and I walking down the street, which is another sort of layer of racism and the pain body of, you know, laws against miscegenation and, you know, seeing people of different races being together. You learn a lot about people when Michael and I walk down the street. I mean, it's like the, the reactions and, and it doesn't even have to be anything people say, you know, because when I look at him, I just see him. And he, when he looks at me, he sees me. But it's not until we like look in the mirror that we actually are like, oh, wow, we actually look kind of uh -huh. different, you know, skin tone wise. But what does that feel like when a person who maybe inside feels that white people should be with white people, and black people should be with white, black people, or that the white man did something bad to the black woman, you know, or that a white mm -hmm. man belongs with a white woman and white children, and, you know, and it's like, it brings a lot up for people. And that's that's the pain body that I think, you know, we're, I feel like that's a part of our mission um, just in being married is that just by walking down the street, not saying a word, there's a healing that's happening that says, yes, this is possible. It doesn't really matter. It's okay. Like whatever's coming up for you, yeah, work through that, that's yours. And let's, let's all step up and in the words of Gandhi, be the change and look in our own hearts and begin to, you know, see where we could grow. And that's what this year of 2020 has been about. Like, look inside. You have nowhere else to go. There's a lot of work. And we can point fingers at everybody else. But, you know, you've got one finger pointing at the other person, right, when you point. And four pointing back at you. So it's like, you know, two ears, one mouth, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's the time to actually start walking our talk because there's nowhere, there's nowhere else to go right. <laughs> except it's so in, in, in introspective. Yeah, so I want to. I, mean, I really want to get your perspective on. I think it's a, a dynamic tension between sort of universalism, like you, uh, you and me are the same, right? Yeah. We are right. one, a and in this world, it's almost like you know, if, if you know the, the the concept of spiritual bypass, yes, right, where people <laughs> just want to <laughs> meditate their, themselves happy and ignore, you know, suppress any dysfunction, rage, anger shame, all that. It feels like there is a a liberal movement that I would call racial bypass. And mm -hmm. I think in the spiritual community, it's very appealing to say, yes. well, look, you, Bianca, you told me that we are the same. We are all made of God stuff. So why are we having a conversation about our differences? Yes, beautiful. I think I'm gonna let Michael take that one. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think part of number one is, is that you know, this idea of being colorblind, this idea of uh, of not seeing race and of, I like racial bypassing, Howard, you it's know, good. that idea is um, I think part of it is that it is a spiritual bypass because in and of itself, there is a unwillingness to look at one's shadow and look at how one feels going through the world. So I had to accept that I'm racist. When I realize that when I walk down the street, I, I, if I see a group of black kids or I see a group of white kids, I feel different. And it was, and, and so it is in that um, sort of reality that we begin to, if we can really accept our shadow and say, yeah, I, you know, a lot of those people that, that a lot of people that like to, and look, I'm a recovering, you know, I, I'm a racist, I am a misogynist. I'm recovering all of these aspects of my humanity. But, you know, uh, Yogananda, the great Indian guru, said, you know, your job is not to go into the Himalayas and meditate until you're enlightened. You're in a body and you're in this world to be in this world. And part of being in this world and part of being in America is dealing with what there is to deal with. And if you just deny it and deny that you have feelings or deny that you see race or deny that you see sex or deny that somebody is, you know, that you have a shadow and you just love everybody. You know, Facebook and social media is great for that. Like everything's great all the time and I never have issues and it's all good and it's all love. And you know, weed is great for that too. Uh, people who smoke a lot of weed love to say, oh, it's all bliss all the time, but don't, you know, don't take high. their weed away from them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and look, I, I smoked weed when I was a kid. Been so there, so no judgment. <laughs> yeah. And but but inside of that, the the what you're doing is you're actually denying your very uh, lesson that you're here to learn. And the lesson I think that we're all here to learn 
in, in my humble opinion, is that we're here to actually accept how we feel, accept that we are in different physical bodies, and through the process of diving into our differences, diving into the parts of our shadows, and really being able to realize that as I accept that I'm a racist and I'm a misogynist and I'm an a-hole many, many times, <laughs> that in that, I can actually forgive myself for my own humanity yes, and then I begin to transcend and I can begin to look at other people in their humanity and through that journey I can actually experience transcendentalism. Mm. There is an aspect of me that has transcended race as a function of having a thousand conversations and being called out on my racism a thousand times by this incredibly beautiful, strong, powerful kick-ass woman <laughs> that doesn't mean that i i haven't still uh, uh, you know another hundred years to go or whatever but at the end of the day it has been that journey of diving into my stuff and accepting all the dark deep you know wounded elements of me of my race of being a white man of the entitlement of being a man of thinking i have all the answers as a man all of those things, it's been, um, it's the aspect of me that has transcended it. It's been a function of doing the work and actually having those conversations and accepting my own, you know, my own darkness. And that's what I think, Howard, you it just, you so beautifully answered your own question by leading with your heart and being transparent and being open and just being willing to shit, to be humble. I mean, that is like one of the, you know, spiritual principles. I mean, that's like part of the eightfold path of liberation under any spiritual path, you know, to just lead with that and know, and I guess on some level, you have to know and believe that there is a higher power that put you here and put you into these circumstances for a reason, for your liberation, for soul um, connection, you know, that all of this is happening for a reason. Everything is happening for a reason. There are no mistakes. And if there's something I'm confronted against, if there's, you know, something in my space that's making me want to resist, if I'm feeling anger, then, you know, in my experience, you know, just sort of the principle of 100% accountability. And I've had to bring this to myself every single day in this space, in the pandemic with Black Lives Matter, with, you know, just the, the transition of life and heading, you know, into middle age and, you know, over the hill, so to speak, um, you know, to really say, okay, if there's something in my space where I'm feeling angry, then that's an area where I'm not taking accountability for something. That's an area that I may be pretending about something. No judgment with compassion and love. It's coming from a divine source for my ultimate good. Mm -hmm. So what might that lesson be? And beginning to get curious with ourselves, like, hmm, let me let me actually treat myself, my life as a scientist might, and 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 actually get curious about well, what is it that I'm so pissed about? You know, people in my neighborhood driving Range Rovers. You know, there's a period where I was just there's like a day <laughs> where I'm so pissed at like. Every driveway had like two white Range Rovers in it. And uh -huh. I, I just found myself, Michael didn't care, but I just found myself being like, and another Range Rover, and another. And I had to be <laughs> like, whoa, okay, what it, like, this is not very peaceful. It's not very yogi, okay? <laughs> you know, you're getting, you're pushing people out for having Range Rovers. It's ridiculous. Okay, it's not the most eco friendly car. It's not a Prius. It's not a Tesla. But why are you so pissed about it? Like, uh -huh. even if that's true, like, so, that's yeah. true for you. And then when you answer those questions, that's when, it starts to get interesting and, and there's a, a new found freedom possible on the uh -huh. other side. Right. Yeah. So that answer just feel, it feels very much like a, a single edged sword in that it, it seems like it's a very honorable thing to turn towards yourself. Yeah. And it feels like it could be com the completely wrong thing to turn toward other people for for to say, well, you know, if black people are angry, they need to work on themselves. Yeah. <laughs> right? No. That's well, yes, and that's beautiful. Thank you for for like taking that universal truth because universal truth is you know one of the reasons why I became a lawyer. You know, it was not necessarily to work in corporate America forever, but to like bring divine universal law and divine justice to myself and to the planet. And that right there is absolutely true. Why am I angry? Why would I be angry at white people? Because there's anger and racism and hatred in my heart. Otherwise, it wouldn't be triggering for me to see it. Even if the, Michael and his ancestors were the worst horrible, misogynistic, patriarchal, slave-owning racists, right, for 600 years, 
why, if I have to hate him as a soul, forget what he did, that's his karma. If as mm -hmm. a soul, I have to hate him and I'm triggered by that, there's something in me that is a perfect reflection of maybe not this lifetime. You know, and I think to myself, I know many multiple lifetimes, I'm sure I was a racist, I was a slaveholder, I was a patriot, I was probably a rapist, I was a lot of things, you know, because to the extent that, I mean, I haven't been raped in this lifetime, but to the extent, the energy of feeling like unsafe, the energy of feeling like, oh, your dark skin doesn't belong here, oh, why are you here? The energy of being questioned, you know, in rooms and in situations and on beaches where no one else was questioned, right? It's like, oh, there's the one black person on the beach. I'm sure she's the one with weed and alcohol. Let's pick her out of a thousand people. Like <laughs> I can be angry and be victim. And there was nothing in there, of course, because I was sober at that point, not before, right? It's like, maybe that's the karma for all the years of craziness. But you know, that aspect of like the universe abhors a vacuum, a vacuum. There's always for every act, there's a, an effect, right? For every cause, there's a consequence, and it may be previous lifetimes. And so we, as black people, and this is one thing too, as we look into and sit in this Black Lives Matter culture, which is really important, these conversations, one conversation I'm not hearing a lot about is, and I think it can only come from a spiritual conversation, is like we, as black people, must look inside of ourselves and say, where are we racist? Where are we hateful? Where are we homophobic? Where are we misogynistic? You know what I mean? Some of the... Um, conversations and, and with some of my friends, my African-American female friends and experiences they've had at the hands of black men, right? You know, very patriarchal, very misogynistic. I'm not saying universally generalized all are, but it's like, you know, he who's without sin cast the first, he cast the first stone. That's it. And I think that is the work that we as black people must do. And as white people do that work, right? We're all working on ourselves. We're coming together, not as I'm the victim and you owe me though. Reparations is a real thing and it's going to happen because it's karma, right? <laughs> But it just is, <laughs> it's inevitable. But you know, two whole um, uh, sort of beings coming together to face each, face each other to do the healing work, but just like any dynamic you know, healthy relationship, there is so much healing and so much you know, positivity that can happen out of that. But if you have two people saying, you're the one that can't, yeah, or one person having to be the one that's the blame and the wrong one and the bad white guy that has to sit there and just shut up and take it all and the black people can do, it's like that will only, so. there's a period where speaking truth is important, but there's a point where it's like, we're only gonna get so far unless both sides mm -hmm. do the deep spiritual work. So I wanna, I wanna ask about that. Cause so my, um, you know, I'm a nice guy, right? So. I was, a, I, was a, I was a nice racist, right? Like, okay. <laughs> right. So like I really started taking responsibility in a different way. I want to say in, in September, I, I came across, I was introduced to Ibram Kendi's work, right? Um, you know, how, how to be an anti-racist. I hadn't heard of him. A white friend of mine said, this, you've got to read his book. And I read his book and like it really profoundly affected me in terms of seeing because he was so humble himself about his own journey from being, you know, a light skinned, you know, racist to um, making speeches as a teenager about how it's black culture and baggy pants. That's the problem. Right. So to like to the whole the whole gamut like his and he's also vegan. But I, I and I tried to get him on the podcast before he became like the best selling author in America, but mm -hmm. I didn't. Um, but then, you know, so I'd really um, it made me kind of understand in a way that allowed me to be humble. It allowed me to look at myself and see, oh, like, oh, that thing I did was racist. And all oh, those words I spoke like, like to sort of like to look at the movie, like to rewatch The Sixth Sense after, you know, the <laughs> end. And it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. now I see it all. <laughs> totally. Right. <laughs> and the next thing I started w reading was uh, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. And I had such a negative reaction to that. Mm. Um, not because I don't think she's right about white fragility, not that I don't think she's right about systemic racism, but like her, her approach, it felt to me like it was a guilt based approach that couldn't that would never allow for transcendence. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm wondering, you know, am I just an, is this another like asshole moment that I have to overcome or is am I is there something I'm, I'm, I'm on to? How about both? <laughs> <laughs> How about both? You know, we, we live in a time of paradox, right? We are um, both evolving at a tremendous rate and it seems like certain parts of society are devolving. You know, there's new life growing every single day and there's millions of people dying like flies, you know, just dropping around the world. So we're constantly, you know, in the divine universal plan, 
there's always something that is, you know, birthing, there's something that's remaining the same, and there's something that's dying. And so all of the above are happening at the same time. And, you know, I think part of the opportunity at this time, you know, both with politics and Black Lives Matter and Me Too and gender, which by the way, Black Lives Matter, cool, great, thank you. When women actually wake up and step into their power, it's going to be, I mean, that's where it's, the, the world is going to explode and implode way bigger than this. That gender is one that is just, whoo, it's coming. So that's my little tidbit warning. Foreshadowing. Been foreshadowing that for minutes, uh -huh. like sleep. When that opens up, ugh. anyway, so get ready for that. I think we're preparing ourselves, all of that's happening is preparing ourselves for, for that. Um, but, you know, my whole point is that at all times, you know, if we step into the lower vibration of dogmatic positioning of this or that and sort of judging life by what we see with our senses and feel, we're gonna miss the totality of the universal divine law and the divine picture, which is always moving us in ways that are beyond our intellectual understanding. So yes, you know, I have heard and I can understand sort of the, the sense as powerful and beneficial as white fragility the book is, that sense of sort of radical unforgiveness, which doesn't really create a space of compassion and opportunity for movement, you know everything's always changing. And so to the degree that out of anger, and I can understand, you know, a black woman in America, a black person being so angry that now I've got your attention and, you know, I'm going to release some of this venom and you're going to take some of the pain. You're going to take some of the pain body. You're going to take some of the poison because I got to put it somewhere. Right. right? So but emotional, re healthy. Yeah. emotional reparations are not karma. Right? Yeah. <laughs> not in the yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's it, an aspect of that, huh. which can be very gratifying right now. It's like, oh, it's a white privilege. <laughs> you know, it's like, why? Because I didn't wash your dishes that you left in the sink. <laughs> it's like, uh, there's a, you know what I mean? Like, and it's she like, said that to me uh, many, many times. So, <laughs> it becomes spiritual, racial, my racially bypassing because I don't want to wash my dishes. But it's like, for 400 years, I had to wash the dishes. <laughs> now you're going to pick my country. That's right. You know, I mean, it's... it's <laughs> We can say that to each other because we've been together so long, but there's an aspect of it where it's like, like you said, that fine line, at what point am I now sort of um, back, backsliding on my own spiritual journey? Your spiritual journey is your spiritual journey, you know, and mine is mine. And when I get to the pearly gates or enlightenment or nirvana, I'm going to have to answer for was I true and just and honest and in integrity with who I know I'm here to be, regardless of the social climate, regardless of the political climate, regardless of the fact that Black Lives Matter is trending. And so that's the opportunity that when this this pendulum is a result of the pendulum that got started in colonialism in Christopher Columbus days and, and before, when the other pendulum of sort of the backlash to that, you know, it's like all the hate, the hateful comments that black people have made against white people just to sort of get the poison out. OK, as cathartic as it is there will be, you know, a pendulum for that as well. So we have to be very mindful as spiritual practitioners and also I think as white people not to take on the guilt. And one of the things the first few weeks, Michael just felt like he was walking around with so much shame and just feeling so bad about himself. And I was like, stop making it about you yeah. and how you feel right. again. You know what I mean? Like that also can be very damaging to the spiritual path. So we have to be balanced in this and not get too dogmatic because we'll lose sight of the big picture. <laughs> right, like I felt like Oh, I can't like I can't win. Like there's this feeling like, oh, if I if I acknowledge what I'm feeling, that I'm centering whiteness again yeah, or right. like, like there's so many ways in which there are paradoxes that. Right. So I'm like, I you know, sort of a question for you um, as you know, as the person walking around with sort of guilt and shame and carrying it the way I have seen myself. Um, so if there's if there's a white pain body, and yeah. which is which is trauma. Like if I was working with someone who was who was traumatized, the thing I wouldn't do, which Robin DiAngelo, the author of White Fragility does, is when when a white person now says, well, now I understand something about systemic racism. What should I do? Her answer is the first question you need to ask yourself is why is this the first time you're asking that question? Which which to me is like if some if someone is, you know, is struggling, is mistaken, is wrong, and all of a sudden they get shown the light and they say, I want to do better. The first thing you do is, well, what took you so long, asshole? <laughs> right. So, well, how do you know, how do how do we deal with with our own trauma without making it about our trauma? <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's the, the million dollar question, Howard, <laughs> that that to me, that's the essence of white privilege is there is this aspect of, you know, 
I don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable or I'm not willing to hold black people's anger. Yeah. We've had so many conversations where I have had to hold sometimes successfully, many times not successfully at all, her anger and her pain. Because at the end of the day, we have been able to, we as white people have been able to coast through this world. White privilege is not about, uh, white privilege is not about like, um, you know, a lack of having to work hard. It's not, you didn't struggle. It's not that you don't work your butt off for what you have. It's not that you didn't have stuff to deal with in your life. That's not what white privilege is. It's specifically that says that you grow up in a, in a world where your color is not the first thing that people see. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it, you're afforded certain privileges that people who have a different color than white people don't have. So, so at the end of the day, my, our, I believe our duty as white people is to say, yeah, you're pissed off. And yes, your book made me feel bad. And yes, you're like, what took you so long? Okay, let me take it. Yes, may I have another? Hmm. I understand your pain and I can't understand your pain and I understand why you're pissed off. And it's my job as this is my opportunity to take the high road. This is my opportunity to be the change I wish to see in the world as Gandhi said. Gandhi had to take the high road and in his own country, where the British, British white people were trying to, you know, were, were colonializing him. He was able to transcend and create freedom for India because he took the higher road. And he said, you can kill us, but we're not going to strike back. And it, it's our opportunity as white people to say, you can, you can spout all the, all the violence and all the anger that you have at me. And I'm still going to love you. Mm. And I'm still going to, to uh, appreciate you and I'm still gonna cry a tear for you because that is my duty as a spiritual warrior. That is what I'm here to do. Christ said, love God with everything you have, heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say love your neighbor if they're the same color as you, but if they're not, don't. Or if, they, if they're trans or not, this is, our, this is our spiritual duty. This is what liberation is. All the people that are spiritually bypassing or racially bypassing, all they're doing is locking it in a closet and saying it's not there. It is there. And it's going to show itself over and over and over again until we learn to accept it, open the door and say, yes, you have every right to be angry. I'm still here, mm. though. I still love you, though. Mm. And through that process, not only can we transcend the anger, but we can actually transcend ourselves as spiritual beings and actually have freedom, mm -hmm. which is so, the great gift. Yeah. So, Bianca, I have a question for you. When Michael does that at, at his best, holds the anger, is a spiritual warrior working on his own liberation, does that um, lead to healing for you? Absolutely. How? And I was feeling that and thinking that, like, as he was saying it, I just felt and, he, and he's been himself from the minute I met him, but I just felt myself exhale. Like, it's like an aspect of the burden I've been carrying and having to like articulate or defend or even not in words, but just energetically. It's like someone else is carrying that for me. When you come out of the grocery store and you got 20 bags, you know, and someone offers to take a couple, oh, hmm. I'm supported and I don't have to do it all myself. And someone else can speak for me for once and I can just rest for a little bit. I mean, the weathering effect for people of color, for African-Americans is a real thing. Their health outcomes are disproportionately, disparately worse as a function of nothing more than having a skin color because of what has to be held, the pain body. And now perhaps as part of the karmic swing, the cycle, we're spreading out some of the, that pain and allowing white people to hold it too. So now we're all holding it together. And what that does for me, it just opens my heart and makes me feel like I can trust him, like I'm being taken care of. And this is not just in a romantic relationship, but with my white friends that do the same thing, I just feel safe and held and like, okay, now I can open up about like the next layer of what I'm struggling with and what I'm working on in my non-perfect state, as opposed to, okay, as soon as I walk in, they're wondering like, how did you get here? And like, what are your credentials? And like, what was your GPA? And like, what kind of car do you drive? Like, who are you? 
you know, where it's like, okay, you bristle and you're like, well, I went to Princeton. Okay, is that enough? Here's my resume. Can I can I get a pass, or do I have to show you like my freedom papers? Like that feeling I've had my entire life, including at Princeton, which you and I share that university. Like, oh my God, so grateful they're beginning to because I's Gruber from the top down. The, the um, I'm going to call him the principal, the president, <laughs> is beginning to like have to kind of answer to these questions and tearing down the Woodrow Wilson School. I'm oh so sorry. You know? <laughs> you know, but um, that sort of support, it just you feel like for the first time after decades of like walking like this, you know what I mean? You can start to put your shoulders down. And what kind of world, what kind of society, what kind of leader, what kind of creative can I be when I'm more open hearted and more relaxed and comfortable in my own space? There's certainly less violence. There's certainly less fear on the planet. And that is something that he's offering by simply being willing to be the change and being willing to take the higher road. And in the words of St. Francis, instead of looking to be consoled, look to console. Instead of looking to be forgiven, can we forgive? Instead of looking to be understood, can we understand? And that is the difficult spiritual work that we're, we're all being asked to do right now. Oh, something just hit me when you gave me the St. Francis quote, which is like white guilt Mm. Is, 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 I, it's manipulative, yeah. isn't it? Like yes. what, what Michael was just saying wasn't, he wasn't diminishing himself in any way. No. no. In fact, he, he, he aggrandized himself spiritually. He became bigger to me. He became brighter to mm. me. He embodied the principle of unconditional love. And that is so magnetic. It's like love is the only, and my guru says, love is the only weapon that cannot be withstood. Hmm. It's like, yes, whatever you have to say next, I'll follow you wherever you want to go because I trust you to be a leader and to, to, to take care of the flock. And the flock is our brothers and sisters. And that is what a good shepherd does. Yeah. And each one of us has the opportunity to do that if we choose. It is hard work to put one other, another, you know, love thy brother as thyself. It's hard work. You know, but that is the work that we're being called to do right now as we step into this time of 2020 vision. Mm. Lots being asked of us. I love and, that. And, and, and hey, it, God doesn't give you what you what you not strong enough to handle. So, okay, time to graduate to the next level. You know, AP, AP yeah. human consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Advanced perception. AP. Advanced perception. It, yeah. <laughs> so I know you guys have a hard stop in just a couple of minutes, um, but what's the and in interestingly, my office door just blew open and there's a storm coming. So what, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep, here it is. But what, what's so, um, you know, there's a lot of white people who are still in denial, who are reacting in anger. I don't exactly think most of them are my audience, but there's a lot of white people who are now sort of waking up and the first wave of, sh of shame and guilt and complicity and yes. complacency. Yes. And, so, yes. and so it is a feeling, like Michael was saying, of sort of like, I need to be consoled. I got to call all my black friends and make sure they still like me. Yeah. Right. Like, so what's if, if like, let's let's accept that place yeah. as what is now. What are the steps to to on the road to becoming this um, integr integral spiritual warrior? I mean, I, I guess, you know, for me, it's just uh, step one is just really owning it. It's just fully and fully owning your racism, fully owning the ways that you perceive people as different because of how they look. And if if that is step one and a willingness to 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 see your own darkness, the willingness to see your own shame and and just like you did howard at the beginning of this call a willingness to say it out loud and speak to it whether yes. it's on social media whether it's to a black person that you know or whatever to speak to it and then to say how what is your experience like and what was your experience with this and and then just to listen that's the biggest thing that I see that's not happening is why people are not willing to listen. Again, as we talked about, like hear the anger, hear what it was like to have to be pulled over at gunpoint because you're black. Hear what it's like to have, you know, a child that, um, you know, that 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 you're worried about them getting killed in the street because of the color of their skin. 
if they played cops and robbers. And so I think that for me, that's like, that's everything. If you can just own your own stuff and journal about it and, and look at it and, and then begin to share it and then begin to ask powerful questions, Questions like, how was I racist to you in the past? Has there ever been anything I've said to you in the past that was racist or that was offensive? And then just sit with it and be with it. And as much as you tr can, try to recreate that what that person is saying to you. You know, nonviolent communication is so powerful because you literally say, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is one, two, three, four, five, six. I think that's the first couple steps. Yeah, and I think all of that you know, out of the stillness emerges the light. And, you know, like a glass of muddy water, I say this to many of my meditation yoga students, they're like, I can't meditate, I can't meditate. You know, all of this, these steps are impossible without a spiritual practice, it's impossible. And just sitting and learning how to sti sit still, you know, the muddy water in the glass, when it's all shook up, it's, there's no clarity, you can't see anything, it's confusing, it's disturbing. But in the stillness, if you just let that glass sit still, right? Eventually, all the dust settles to the bottom and the water runs clear. And in that stillness, we can see ourselves, we can see the solutions, we can see that we are one. And it doesn't come without that. And we can't intellectually know it now. We have to be willing to walk a, ma a million miles in another person's moccasins and feel what that feels like and be willing to go on the journey of not being able to control how we're gonna react emotionally and what they're gonna think and manipulate them to think, to make sure that they think I'm not racist and all these controlling things and just trust the journey through the stillness and the listening and the introspection, you will get to the other side. And yeah, maybe as white people, you've never had to do that work before. You know, like they said to Neo in the Matrix, well, why do my eyes hurt, right? You've never used them before, Neo. So you'll get there. You're a superhero. You can do this, yeah. but it's going to take some training. <laughs> oh, your audio. You're uh, on mute, Howard. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, oh, the, the storm is very loud. But I was just okay. saying, it's, it's so much easier to just go to a protest and, and not do that work. Yes. <laughs> Hold it up is. a sign. Yeah. <laughs> and if all, of, all else fails, just hold up a sign and it says Black Lives Matter. <laughs> Right. right? I, That's a step, you know. Yeah. I, I had the bracelet before. It was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a step. It's one step. Right, right. Right. Well, I know you guys have to go. And um, I, gosh, thank you so much. I mean, people are going to be watching this and listening to this, but they're they're just they're not in my head right now. Like I'm I feel like you guys have given me such gifts of of clarity and of direction and of, of grace. So I, I'm so happy that we, we met, that we've stayed in touch, and that we're, we're on this journey together. Yeah, us too. Thank you so much for giving us a, a space and a platform and just for listening. Thank you. Yes. Oh, and, and <laughs> you know, so it started because you guys sent out an email. So can you talk <laughs> about how people can follow you and, and yes, thank you. <laughs> get your emails and be part of your world? Yes, absolutely. Well, first, you can watch Conscious Living, uh, which is now on Amazon Prime. And it's fourth season. So if you have Amazon Prime, go watch us. You can visit us at ConsciousLivingTV.com. And we're on Instagram at ConsciousLivingTV and Facebook at ConsciousLivingTV and on Twitter at ConsciousTV. So you can sign up for our newsletter on our website and get our lovely uh, sort of journey to being the change we want to see. And that's everything from vegan fashion and food to eco travel and, you know, transcending racism, you know, in a world that uh, is evolving in the middle of a pandemic. So I think we're all on this journey. We've got a lot of work to do. We'd love to do that with people who are committed to that work, too. Awesome. Yes, thank you, Howard. Yeah. And keep up your great work. Well, congratulations. Thank you, thank you guys so You're much. It. You're yeah. doing it. I'll catch keep being the light. All right. All right. Talk to you later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Howard. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>